chapter 9 while I get the microphone on here. That's the Old Testament. Yeah, that's the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to be looking at just one verse this morning. Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to be looking at verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Would you bow your heads with me for a word of prayer? Lord, we come to you once again this morning. And we ask, Father, that you would open our hearts to your word, open our eyes to what you would have us to see, and open our ears, Father. And I pray, God, that you would just move upon us this morning. I pray, God, that we would be able to quiet the busyness of the world and the busyness of the week, Father, and we would be able to just be authentic worshipers of you. That we would be able to just... Zone in on what you would have for us, Father, and not think about the other things that are going on in life, not think about what's going on afterwards, but, Father, just completely be an open vessel for you to fill. And we'll, we thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as I read uh, one, of the, one of the more familiar Christmas verses this morning, we, um, and as we look at it today... And this is probably one of the most well-known Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. But what I want to look at today is I want to kind of look at the historical context of what's going on here. Isaiah speaks to people uh, living in three time periods, before Babylonian exile, during Babylonian exile, and after Babylonian exile. Now in chapter 9, Isaiah is speaking to the southern kingdom of Israel, Judah, before the Babylonian exile. And Israel and Syria are pressuring pressuring Judah to form a coalition against Assyria. Ahaz, the king of Judah, is afraid to go against Assyria, so he sends a king's ransom to Assyria asking for their help. Isaiah spoke into a situation where Judah felt powerless. And they were afraid of the rulers of the north. As their enemies only seemed to grow in strength and to tighten their grasp, they didn't know if God was for them or against them, or if He had just simply abandoned them. And among Isaiah's prophecies about their future defeat, exile, and return, he included two prophetic visions of a child who would represent God's presence, who would embody his characteristics and bear the responsibility of governing his people. So when we look at this When we look at this prophecy, what I want you to realize, and I go through the historical context of it, is because I want you to know where the people were at when they were hearing this. What was going on in their reality when they were hearing this. So the most popular prophecy of Jesus in the Old Testament is actually given to a people that know that the danger is inevitable. They know that danger is coming. They know that danger is on the horizon. They know the things that that, that might come and the people, the enemies that are coming up against them. And yet we have this prophet who at that time, when you look at the the prophets, what they were is they were a mouthpiece of God. When a prophet was sent to a people, the prophet was, uh, was, he was given the duty to speak for God. And as fear gripped their hearts and gripped the hearts of the people, the prophet or the mouthpiece of God spoke these words, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Now, what I want you to realize is Isaiah is speaking into a situation that the people are gripped with fear. 
And they, they, they would go to these prophets, and these prophets would come to them, and they would say, okay, you're going you're to have all the answers. You're going to give us the answers to our problem. We've got enemies that are trying to come in. We've got pressure from all of this. We're gripped with fear. What are you going to do? And all of a sudden, the prophet is talking about this child being born. Really? That's your answer? Your answer is that, okay, so we've got, we've got enemies surrounding us. We've got enemies that are going to come and they're going to take us into captivity. And you want to talk about a child that's coming and we don't even know when? Because if he were to come today, what, what is a baby going to do? And you see, what they had is they had extreme fear, not about the future, but they had the fear about the enemy that was at the gate. And a lot of times, even in today, us, us as Christians, we live in that fear, not about tomorrow, not about the someday, not about the big picture, but we say, God, I, I know that all of this stuff is true. I know that you've made me some promises, but God, I need something now. Not tomorrow, not in a week. I need you to move now. Because something happens when we're pressured by the enemy. There's something happens when we have the trouble is right there on our doorstep. And then all of a sudden, they, though we say that we trust God for our eternal state, we all of a sudden can't trust Him to allow us the provisions to fix the car, to allow us the provisions to be able to um, buy the groceries that week. We say that we serve a God that is sovereign. And if we serve a God that is sovereign, don't you think that He knows better than you how to deal with the, with the immediate threats? But you see, He doesn't always deal with them in the way that we see fit. And that's, the, and that's the reason when Jesus actually came and when Jesus was born, and then he goes through life and he lives a pretty typical life. He did, it would make sense if, if it was going to be the coming of a Messiah. It would make sense that he would be born into riches. He would be born into something great. But yet here he is and he's born in, into a humble place, into a humble family. And, he, and, and to the point that he doesn't even have a place indoors to be born in. And this is supposed to be the Messiah? And he grows up. And he goes and he's teaching. And, and people would agree, man, he, he can really teach. He's not, he's not been educated in this, but he can, he can really teach. But yet, isn't, this, isn't he just the son of a carpenter? We know where he comes from. And Jesus was the Messiah that they needed, but he was not the Messiah that they wanted. Because when Jesus would come and He would talk about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, what you've got to realize is when He was talking about the kingdom of heaven, they were not thinking about eternity and the someday. They were thinking about the kingdom being restored back to Israel that very moment. When the disciples are arguing, uh, uh, teacher, when can we sit at your right and your left hand at the end the, when you establish your kingdom? They weren't thinking about eternity. They were thinking about right now because they thought, hey, we know we're going to follow him. And one of these days he's going to turn this flame up and we are going to rebel against the Romans. He's going to overthrow them and he's going to restore the kingdom back to Israel. That's what they thought he was going to do. It's not what he said he was going to do. But that's what they thought he was going to do. And here we are with this prophet. Give us some answers. And yet he goes on and just because two chapters before Isaiah says, for to, before he says, for us a child, to us a child is born, he prophesied the birth of a child whose name would signify the very presence of God. Isaiah 7.14 says, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, 
the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel meaning God with us. God with us. See, we have, we have things that go on in our lives. We have enemies that come knocking on the door. We have things that will go wrong. <coughs> but if you can grasp nothing else throughout all of God's Word, but if you can just grasp His name, God <coughs> with us, the same God that spoke everything into existence. The same God that will, in the, in the end of days, that will but speak a word and will take out all the nations that rise up against Him. That same God is with you. And if He's not, He can be. And the reason that we shouldn't only celebrate the coming of the Messiah in December is because it should blow our minds and motivate us all year long. It's not that things don't go wrong. It's not that we don't have struggles. It's not that we don't have bad days. But if you can just continually go back to that idea, yeah, I'm struggling right now, but God is with me. And God is with me. We serve a God, not, the, not a little figurine that we put on our keychain that, that I can pray to, but I actually serve a God that is active in my life. I actually serve a God that works all things together for good for those who love Him. And if I love Him, doesn't that mean that all things are working together for good? We say it with our mouths, but what do we live it through our lives? That that bad day is working for the good of me. That that difficult person is working for the good of me. For this bad, this bad depressing time in my life, I've just got to believe that it's working for the good of me because he said so. And he's never, he's never not delivered on his promises. God with us. We should celebrate it all year long. Why? Number one, because God became flesh. I want to stop here for a moment because we, we acknowledge this, but I want you to really think about this. God created everything that you see. He didn't even just, He didn't have to break a sweat. He spoke it into existence. He didn't take six days because it took Him that much. He just wanted to. God said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke the creatures, the sea animals. He spoke everything into existence. There is nothing that He cannot do. He is all-powerful, almighty, sovereign God. There is no problem. There is nothing that comes at His doorstep that He hasn't already figured out. But yet, He humbled Himself, and the Creator became like His creation. And though we, we can't even begin to wrap our heads around how humbling that would be to, for a creator to become like his creation, think of it like this. Think of a, a king that ruled over the kingdom. But then one day, the king decided, you know what, I'm going to step down from the throne. I'm going to go out. I'm going to work in the marketplace. I'm going to be just like one of you. Or, or if in our country, could you imagine what it would be like if we had the President of the United States says, you know what, I, I'm not just going to be up here making political decisions and doing all of this, but I'm actually going to come to your job. I'm actually going to work side by side with you and do what you do. We would say, man, that, that's amazing. Can you believe it? We would be telling people for the rest of our lives, man, there was this time the President of the United States came and worked side by side with me and we were, and we were working and we, we were in hard labor. We would think that that's amazing. And the President or a king doesn't even compare because he's the king of kings. And yet he humbled himself. And he became flesh. John 1.1 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you have any 
question as to what John is talking about under the uh, it, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, if you scroll down to verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of this only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's what it was. That's what, be, what began all those years ago, is it wasn't just this cute little baby in a manger that we like to sing about, that we like to talk about one time a year, but it was actually God, the almighty creator, humbling himself and becoming flesh to dwell among us. Not only did he become flesh, but number two, he became sin. Second Corinthians 5.21. I feel like this is somebody's favorite verse in here. <laughs> for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Stop right there for just a moment. So God became flesh. He didn't only become flesh. He didn't come become flesh like at the highest form of flesh. He became flesh so he could therefore become sin. He knew no sin. In fact, the Bible says he was tempted at every point, yet without sin. I shared this with the school last Thursday. I said, you know what? There, there's nothing that you've ever gone through that, that you can't say that God it can't sympathize with you. Because the Bible says he was tempted at every point, yet without sin. So every single temptation you've ever endured, he endured, yet he defeated it. He had victory over it for your sake. He knew no sin so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Now I know that I'm speaking about a lot of things that a lot of people in here have had knowledge about. But, I, but my, my ask this morning and what I've had to ask myself is do I just know it in my head or do I allow it to impact my heart? Do I just know it so I can say it out of my mouth or do I allow it to actually embody what I'm living for? That the almighty God became flesh. That the Almighty God went on to become sin because he, had, because he knew no sin, He had no sin, and therefore He took on my sin. He took on my shame. He took on my guilt and my filth so that that way He could transfer, He could impute His righteousness upon me. You see, because God is a just judge. He is just in every judgment that He ever makes. There's never a judgment that God has ever made that was unjust. But if you have, and, and, and think of this with me for a moment, that what if we had a, um, a judge that was just about justice, but, not, but, but without mercy? Think about that for a moment. I come into a courtroom and, 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 and you've got the judge setting up there and, I, and I, I did something stupid. It's been years ago. I made bad decisions. I got in with the wrong crowd. I'm a different person today. But he looks at me and says, you know what? Did, were you guilty of that? Yeah, I'm guilty, but I've changed. These are the things that I've done. I'm really sorry for what I've done. I want to be able to, to, to turn this life around and to do something to try to, to, try to make up for for what I've done, but he says, you know what? No, you already done that. You've already, you, you, you're already guilty, so I'm going to lock you up. You are going to stay there. I'm going to throw away the key. It doesn't matter how much you repent. It doesn't matter what you do. You are guilty, so I'm going to treat you today just like you did it today. Someone has to pay. It's what justice is. Someone has to pay. Somebody gets hurt, somebody has to pay. 
And for God to be a just God, someone has to pay for the penalty of sin. He can't just allow anybody to go free because that's not justice and that's not who He is. But on the other hand, God is also a merciful judge. Let's take another scenario. We come before the judge, and, and I've committed all of these crimes. And they say, well, are you sorry for what you've done? Ah, well, you know, I'm, I'm more sorry that I got caught. Well, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of I'm sorry. I, I probably shouldn't have done that. But, you know, at the same time, you don't know the family I grew up in. You don't know the circumstances that were surrounding it. So it really wasn't my fault. But say that judge decided to have mercy and say, you know what? I, I, I feel like you're not going to do it again. So here, go ahead, unlock him, let him go free. There would be people that would be, uh, be screaming at the top of their lungs that, that that's not justice. We deserve justice. But it was mercy. And I would say that we can all agree that all justice and no mercy is not good. But I think that we can also agree that all mercy and no justice is also not good. Yet God, as a judge, has to remain just and merciful. And through Jesus Christ and His first coming, God is both just judge and merciful justifier. And it becomes together in the God-man We have the judge sitting up there say, you know what? Yes, I committed that crime. I've committed that crime, and I know that I've got to suffer my own penalties. I know that I've got to do that. Well, then somebody else tries to take my penalty. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll take his penalty. Well, the problem is, okay, well, you actually, we've had a warrant out for you for a long time. You're guilty of your own sins, so we'll take you too. It makes sense for the judge to say, you know what, you've got to pay for the crimes you've committed. We get that, right? You've got to pay for the injuries that you've caused. You've got to suffer for the suffering that you've caused. We get that. What doesn't make sense as if the perfect judge gets off of his throne, steps down, picks us up and says, you know what? Send me away. I'll go pay your penalty for you. It doesn't make sense. I get the punishment piece. People have a hard time with, with, with eternal punishment. No, I get that. What I don't get is God becoming flesh and becoming sin, dwelling among these people, being tempted at every point, yet without sin, and stepping down from His throne and saying, you know what? You can't pay the price. I'm going to pay your wages for you. If that's not motivation, I don't know what is. Right. If we need any more, I don't understand. That's why I don't understand the whole prosperity gospel that God somehow needs to sell us on the fact that He's going to bless us with all these earthly things that aren't going to mean anything in a hundred years. Amen. To me, that's enough. That is the prosperity gospel that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords stepped down off of His throne and paid a sin debt that I could never repay. And not only that, but now He wants to have a relationship with me. He wants to be an active God in my life. And He actually wants to have to do with me. And He wants to change me. He wants to make me a new creation. He wants to make me better. And He wants to make me like Him. Are you kidding me? What more prosperity could we want? Amen. If we would truly grasp what that means, we would say, oh, it comes to the money, take the money. I don't want it. I don't need it. Oh, it comes to earthly possessions, yeah, take it. All I need is a relationship with my Father because He's able to supply every need. Right. 
because the reality of it is we're powerless to deal with our sin. It's not about choose better. It's not about choosing better, deciding that today I'm going to be better. Today I'm going to have a better attitude. Today I'm not going to use drugs. Today I'm not going to drink alcohol. Today I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. You can try to choose better. And there are people that wake up every single day thinking today's the day I'm going to be set free. But if you're operating only in your flesh, you're actually powerless to overcome that. And we see a picture of this in Romans chapter 7 and beginning in verse 15. Paul says, for I do not understand my own actions. Have you ever been in a place that you're like, why am I doing that? Why am I acting this way? I know that it's wrong. I know where it ends up. But Paul says, for I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. A lot of people think, well, you know what? I'm just going to get married and that's going to help me get over this sin. That's going to help me get through this because all of us, after all, I'm going to want to be a good husband. I'm going to want to be a good wife. And then when that doesn't work, they say, okay, well, we're going to have children. Now, surely if I have children, I'm going to make better decisions because my decisions are not only going to impact me, they're going to impact my children. But no, no, no. Every single time in yourself, you're powerless against it. You're always going to choose you. You're always going to choose you. I don't say that to be harsh. I say that to be real because if we, if we needed, if we could choose better, he doesn't need to make us a new creation. Right. We don't choose better. We choose him and he makes us better. Amen. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that is good. So now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. We have to take a big, long look in the mirror. Say, so you know what? You can't do this. Self-help is not a real thing. We need help from Him. He knew that we needed help from Him. And His answer to you might not be to all of a sudden start raining down all these financial blessings and all of these, uh, all of these physical blessings. His answer to you might be, I'm going to bring you so low that you can finally stop trying to shake yourself free from this and give it to me and let me take care of it. For I do not the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. If there is ever a passage that deals with the struggles of life and the struggles of addiction, it's this right here. Nobody ever takes a drink and, and wants to become a drunk. Nobody ever, nobody ever indulges in a drug wants to become a drug addict. Nobody ever does those things. Thinking that where it's going to lead. It goes on to say, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. I don't know about you guys, but this, this, this passage hits home with me. Because I can think to those times that I'm like, why am I doing this? I know the right thing to do. I know the right choices to make. And I know, and I know if, I, if I make the wrong choices, if I do the wrong thing, I know how I'm going to feel afterwards. I know where it leads. I have all the head knowledge. 
And you kind of hear, hear it come to the point, a point of desperation in chapter and in verse 24. Wretched man that I am, he asked a question, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's where we have to come. That's the only way that we will be set free from anything, that we will ever have any type of victory. We come to a place, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me because I've tried everything? I've tried every program. I've tried every book. I've tried all of these things. Who is going to deliver me from this body of death? And then we can think back. It's this child that was born. That's the whole reason that he came. That's the whole reason that he came. This child that would come, not, and, 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 and not just for the immediate deliverance of Israel, but he came with you on his mind. He came living that out because he knew 2,000 years later you would be in this place, you would be struggling with this, and he would be able to say, you know what, I was tempted like that, but you know what, I pushed through and I was without sin because I knew that I had to pay the price that you couldn't pay. Who will deliver me? Our passage this morning goes on to say that the government will rest on his shoulders. This affirms his lordship. And that for the sake of time, we won't look at the verses that talk about his, his lordship. Because I want to get into something before we close this morning. And this time is often associated, this time of year is often associated with, with uh, very joyful times for some, but for others, it could be a very tragic time of year. For some people that are that are happy and joyful and, and they're they're going around and they're singing Christmas carols and we get to be with family, we get to do all of these things. There are other people that sit around all year long just dreading it because they know the hurt and the pain and the things that are going to come up with this time of year. And maybe you're here this morning and this time of year puts you in a bad place both mentally and emotionally. Maybe it's the stress of, I can't provide the way that I want to. I see all of these people that are, that are buying these gifts for all these people, and I, I want to, but I just can't. It, it's, just, it, it's just financially, it's not, it's not possible for me to do that. And you get all stressed out, and you try to figure out, how can I give more to people, and how can I, how, how can I buy these presents, and how can I provide for my children? Or maybe it's just a painful memory of what once was. And I remember uh, Christmas, we used to all sit around. I remember Christmas, I would share with this person or that person, and they're not here anymore. And I don't get to see them anymore. I don't get to talk to them anymore. And this time of year, maybe it was their favorite time of year, and now all of these things, you hear their favorite Christmas song, and all it does is bring tragedy back into your heart. You can't enjoy it because it hurts so bad. But I want to encourage you today because the same God that has the shoulders broad enough to and carry the entire government on his shoulders is the same God whose shoulders are broad enough to pick you up and carry you out of that place of despair. He is the same God that asks you to cast your cares before Him. Why? Because He cares about you. In fact, Psalm says that He, Psalms says that he stores our tears in a bottle. There's never a tear that you've cried that He's not there. Oh, sometimes it doesn't feel like He's there, but trust me, friend, He is. And he doesn't only see every tear that you cry, but he actually stores it because he wants to take all that pain, past, present, and future, from you. He came, he died, he rose again, not just to save us from hell, but to save us from ourselves. 
O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He came to save you from yourself, to set you free from yourself, so you don't have to serve the flesh anymore. You can serve and become a slave of righteousness. And he's standing at the door, knocking and waiting for you to let him in. He's not going anymore. Well, you know what? I need to make better choices and then I'll let him in. I need to clean the house up a little bit before, before I let him in. No, he specializes in cleaning out all the garbage. And he'll do a way better job than you ever will. He actually wants the mess. He wants to see it. He already knows. After his resurrection, he goes to the upper room. He doesn't actually need you to open the door. He can actually go through the door. He is the door. But he wants you to invite him in. All the garbage, all the mess, and he wants to fix it for you. Because he is a wonderful counselor. There's no amount of baggage that you can bring that you can bring to the table that he can't deliver you out of. He's mighty God. He is the my, he is mighty and he will hold you up in his arms that never get tired. People will let you down. I will let you down. God will never let you down. He is the everlasting Father. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. People change and people let you down, but God never will. And lastly, He is the Prince of Peace. And my question for you this morning is, do you need peace? He died to give you peace with God. But he lives to give you the peace of God. It's not that he magically, he doesn't sprinkle fairy dust and magically take all your problems away. He doesn't deal in um, you speaking random stuff into existence that really don't mean anything. But he actually deals and the fact of you being smack dab in the middle of the storm, everything falling apart, chaos all around you, the bottom falling out, the, the walls closing in. And in, as Paul puts it in Philippians, he actually wants to deal in giving you a peace that surpasses all understanding. So from the ones outside looking in, thinking, man, he's really or she's really going to crack now. They're really in for it now. They're really going to fall apart now. Let's see what they do. And wait, they've got this peace. I know that their life is chaos, but they've got this peace that surpasses all understanding. Because it's not in yourself, it's in him. And if we keep our eyes on God with us, there's nothing that can take us down. What happens? The most tragic thing that could ever happen, what we die for a believer, that's not tragic at all. We actually just get to go be with our dad. Have every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to give you just a, just a moment to respond. Maybe this morning you've had the head knowledge, you've heard this before, you've been around churches during Christmas time, and you know about the baby, but maybe today is the first time that you actually can almost hear that knocking, him wanting to come in. It's very, very simple. All you got to do is open the door. Just ask him. Just allow him in, and he promises that he will come in, he will eat with you, he will give you a new heart. It's not about you cleaning your heart. He wants to give you a new one. So if you would just say, Lord, come into my heart. Save me. Make me a new creation. Make me more like you. Save me from my sin. Clean me from the inside out. And if you're asking him that this morning, if you're trusting in, in him to save you this morning, would you just slip your hand up? I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. So for those that have accepted Christ, say, so you know what, I, I, I've, I've heard this, I know this, what are we doing for him?
we should be the most joyful, motivated people in all of the earth. Lord, we are so grateful for you. We're grateful for your word. We're grateful for this time that we get to celebrate the coming of the Messiah, Father. I pray, God, that you would be with our pastor in the next service. I pray that you would just anoint what you would have him to say. And, Father, anoint for us to be able to listen and to respond, Father. And I pray, God, that if there's one that dwells in here, the one that comes in here that doesn't know you, that they wouldn't put it off, not for a single second. They would come to know you as their personal Savior. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you.